All right, welcome to, I think, episode 27, Winnipeg Weight Loss Show. But we're expanding our horizons today with uh, a fellow Canadian, but someone who's based in Toronto. Uh, close confidant of one of my mentors, Vince Del Monte, his brother, Adrian. Younger brother, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, he's dabbled in the online fitness space, but he's an English teacher by trade. So it's kind of a cool, unique perspective I bet you bring to this industry and diving into the coaching space. So we're yeah. excited to have you on. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Mitch. I really appreciate it. So I, I actually want to ask this first because I see it in your Instagram stories. Is your daily active service? We'll get into your morning routine in a second, but I, 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 this really caught my eye. So maybe expand on this for those who don't know what you're, what I'm referring to here. My daily act of service. Okay, so I believe in the power of a strong morning routine. I think if you, for dads and moms, you can't control everything. <laughs> you know, you can't control many things. You can control what time the bell's going to ring, but that puts so much pressure on like what's going to happen in that morning, that hour in the morning, like the witching hour when you're trying to get the kids fed and whatever. So for me, I'm a very early riser. And, and I have like a quick morning routine. It's, it's about 25 minutes. And the first thing that it starts with is an act of service. So it's one of three things. Sometimes it's all three things. I like to do three things in the morning. So my, my typical is um, I empty the dishwasher. Um, another early act of, uh, act of service is um, fold a load of laundry or I make the kids lunches. Sometimes it's all three. Sometimes it's one of those. And the reason I do that Number one, it helps my wife. Like that's number one. I, I actually, my dad's been joking a lot with us as we're getting older. He goes, you know, I could take or leave you guys, <laughs> right? But your mother, I chose her. I'm staying with her forever. So number one, it's prioritizing our marriage. Number two, it's modeling what I expect and my wife expects in our home. And then the big one is I, I see my core identity as a leader, but a servant leader. That's like, that's really important to me. And so the first act I do in the morning grounds me and like the whole orientation of my day is service. And it's a little thing, right? It's emptying the dishwasher takes about as much time as it takes for my Keurig to drop a coffee out for me. And by the time the coffee's coming out, the dishwasher's empty. I'm sitting down usually to journal or um, start writing for the day. And so that, that morning action grounds me. Other guys do different things, right, Mitch? I don't know what your morning routine looks like. Other guys like the cold shower or I don't know, uh, going for a walk or praying or something. But I find for me, the, the, the simple act of service orient orients me towards like the man I'm trying to become. So that's why I do it. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I actually was going to ask you why, what it gives you, because I know what it gives your family, right? Um, but you already answered that servant leaders type thing. Well, you know, a lot of these guys, when I first started hanging around in, in, in my brother Vince's world, guys like Bedros, they talk about like the first act out of bed, like the alarm clock test. Right. And so when the alarm clock goes on, they off, they say it's an opportunity to either be a person of your word or a person who, can't keep his word to himself. And I like that. So the alarm clock test is important for me. More important than that, to be honest with you, is how my wife feels. And the, and the alarm clock test is good for me, but mm -hmm. the act of service serves both of us. So, I mean, it's, it's a win-win for everybody, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Stacking wins to start the day. I build momentum off of that 100%. Little things lead to the big things. So did you have a conversation with your wife about the five love languages, acts of services, higher list, or did you just kind of Come, come up to this, come to this resolution on your own? It's a good question. Um, I think the success of a good marriage, the success of a good relationship. Actually, if there's one thing I'll say today that might actually be worth writing down is that I think marriages that work, work because the partners know each other and they're okay with the things they know about the partner, right? Like lots of us know what our partner is like and we're kind of upset about it. You know, it's like, oh... There's Mitch again doing Mitch's that, you know, it's this like almost resentment that your partner is the way they are. My wife and I have learned a lot about each other. Five love languages is certainly one of the book. We've done a lot of work with a tool called the Enneagram. And so we just understand each other. And my wife's love languages are our service. Like she experiences love through service. I also give love through service. And so, you know, that, that has been just a happy coincidence. 
And so, yeah, it's, it's something that just works for us. But I think it has to be part of a conversation or an ongoing dialogue where you're really trying to understand your partner's wiring. Like I've been married 15 years and I learn new things about my wife every day, like just like new things. She's got a new friend or she's doing something new with her, her clients or, or whatever it is. So I think getting on the same page with your partner is, is really key. Maybe the dishwasher is, you know, we're fortunate that works for us. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an easy thing that goes a long way. Do you guys schedule in one-to-one -one time? I know you've got three young kids and it can create challenges. I don't know if you do a scheduled date night, night like some recommend or if it's a little yeah. less formal. Yeah, dude, you, you, you've got little kids. If it's not on the schedule, it's not happening. Like it's, it's, I don't know, like it's, so date nights for me and Amy aren't a big one. That's not one that we have prioritized. Um, I, I don't know why date nights haven't been a big one for us. The big one for us is something we call the D15 or the daily 15. And what we try to do, we try to do it. I mean, it, it always changes when we're doing it because of the different season in life. So right now, it's at 1.30 in the afternoon. That's when both her schedule and my schedule are both my teaching day is, my active teaching day is done. My wife hasn't had to do her classes or her clients yet. And so that's when it works. You know what, this summer when I'm off, we'll probably put it first thing in the morning. And so we just sit, we tell the kids, we let them watch. Right now they're into Ninjago. I don't know. I, it, I, you tolerate it, right? But you, we <laughs> save part of their TV time for Amy and I to go sit on the front porch. So much better in Canada in the months we're heading into. We have a tea. Mm -hmm. And we just, again, get on the same page. Like, what's going on? What's on your mind this week? Or what's on your mind today? And initially, it probably would feel forced for a couple to do that. But I imagine, Mitch, most of your clients find, like, progressive overload, <laughs> super forced when you start it too, right? It's like, I got to write this down. Mm -hmm. Like I got to mm -hmm. track my portion. I don't know what method you use, but like, you know, and so initially it feels forced to say, this is our daily 15, but now it's just part of like what we actually do. So yeah, we, we do schedule it for sure. Otherwise it's not going to happen. Like the kids, mm -hmm. something else, something else will take its importance. Like, um, and, and, and a mentor of mine likes to say, if you don't fill your calendar with things of high priority, things of less priority are going to take their place. That's great. That's beautiful. Yeah. And the 15 minutes, that seems achievable and doable to me. Like the date night every week after week, expecting a babysitter to step in. That's a tall order for us at our stage in life. So I, I like this. I think I'm going to implement this. It's in my you, notes. You know what I would say? Because people are going to be like every day. Mm. You know, th this is a trap that a lot of people fall into in fitness, in life and whatever. They buy the lie of the all or nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. if we can't do it seven out of seven, then what's the point? It's the same as like, if I can't hit my nutrition, fine. I'm just going to eat the whole box of Oreos. And and it's like, if we miss it one day because something comes up, we try not to let it go like four, five, six days. You know, a bad habit can then form. We just get back on it the next day. And And when we do get a date night, I would say those are more like, those are the exceptions. We go on date nights, but it's not that one is not high on our list of priorities. The the daily one is. And so someone else might say we can't do it daily. And so we are going to put date night. We're going to make that every other week. We're going to do it every other Thursday. We're going to and people need to take action like this. Probably if you want it to happen, like call up your sitter and, and say, these are the next six Thursdays I need. Right. And and then you're almost like, you know, you're putting some skin in the game. 100%. It's not scheduled. It doesn't happen. We always say that with the workouts as well. And time will expand and something else will take its place. Yeah, it really That's does. Brilliant. Nice. So just, I, just to circle back to morning routines, I know a lot of the listeners are in similar space in life, kids, career, everything comes before their own fitness. And you found a way to really make a massive transformation recently. We'll talk about that 16 week uh, battle you went through. But how do you start your day to ensure workouts happen? Yeah. So my morning routine, you know, th this is something, this is a mindset shift for busy parents. Y you have to almost rearrange your life so that it doesn't inconvenience your family because my, my kids and my marriage are the most important thing. And so if, if I can't lift in the morning, or let me rephrase, if I don't go to the gym in the morning, 
then it's done. I- I'm not texting my wife at 5 p.m. <laughs> that we call that the battleground. 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Parents, especially the last hour, that's the real battleground. <laughs> um, and and if I don't get it done in the morning, it's not going to happen. And so part of me knows that. Part of me knows if I don't go this morning, it's not going to happen. N- number two, you know, I've been at this so long that it feels way more weird for me not to go to the gym than it go than it than 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 to go to the gym. Like I'm not forcing myself. And this is something we talk a lot about is acting as if. Right? When people are forming a new habit, it's hard to act as if because it's a new habit. But but I like to pretend. Like I act as if I'm an athlete. What do athletes do? They go to the gym. I act as if I'm a good husband. So I'm not, I'm not perfect. Let's, let's put that on the record here, Mitch. <laughs> I'm not even close to perfect, <laughs> uh, but I act as if I am. And so we do our D15. Um, I act as if I'm a good husband. And so we try to eat dinner every night as a family, like together. And so acting as if drives me to the gym. The other piece that I would say is the bridge that holds my like commitment to my results is my accountability group. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just like every morning in our, in our group chat, in our coaching group, um, there's guys posting videos of themselves, pictures, ham at the gym. They do it for their own accountability. I do it. And it's just our way of saying like, we're in this together. Um, you know, as well as I know, if, if you're going to the gym in, in Winnipeg and you have a buddy there, the likelihood of you getting there increases significantly. Right. And so while that's not always possible for people, if you don't have a training partner at your actual gym, a virtual community does work. It works really, really well. Um, And so I like, and then the final piece obviously is I feel so much better after I work out, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I hate cliches, but I always feel better coming out always. Like, you know, even if I didn't have a great workout, or I was a bit distracted in my workout. I always feel better when I come back out, sets up my energy for the day. Um, and then I just, you know, I've had a good coffee, a good workout, good morning routine. And then whatever else, ha- whatever else happens in the day, I've had those things for myself. That's brilliant. Yeah, you touched on some really keys there, like identity shift. That doesn't happen overnight, but like becoming that fitness person. And once you've made that shift, you're not missing workouts, you know, or rarely are because you've, identified as that fitness person who just does it on autopilot, so to speak. And then the accountability to the group and then how you feel after trying to realize the benefits beyond just chasing a number on a scale or, or losing weight is how it affects you mentally and physically. So. You know, the, the final piece I would say about morning routines, Mitch, is like too many people online are talking about the morning routine as if it should be painful, mm-hmm. right? Like the wake up at 2 a.m., Actually, I, I, were you at Vince? I don't know if you're at Vince's mastermind, the one in um, Nashville last year. And and one of the guys was saying he wakes up at two forty five. Yeah, Wes Watson, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then actually, one of his proteges, Kevin, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Kyle Carnahan, does the two forty five as well. And I'm like, what do you do? Huh. But it works for them. M- my point on morning routines is it has to be enjoyable. Like, I'll give you an example. When I know I have a good coffee brew that I like, that drives me to get out of bed. Mm-hmm. When, when even, even the clothes you wear, like when I was a runner, there were certain shorts that I don't know if it was superstition or what, but it created a positive association in my mind of putting these clothes on. I liked how they looked. I liked how I felt in them. So I lay those out the night before. Even this is another big one. I like to read five to 10 pages in the morning. And something as an English teacher, I try to teach my students is stop reading books that you don't like. Like if I say to you, Mitch, hey, you should go read um, The Gap in the Game and you start reading it and you hate it and your goal is to read five pages every morning, but you hate this book, you're not going to read, you're not going to wake up. So if you hate the book, stop, get a better book. And so I think a good morning routine should be compelling. My friend Kevin Torres taught me this. Like if you have a, if you have a preload that is gross, like get a better preload. <laughs> like if, you know, <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, if, if the coffee is no good, get better coffee. And so like you, you make the morning routine, something that's exciting for you versus like, 
you know, you just see guys like I'm going to wake up early and I'm going to read three chapters and take a cold shower. And it's like, you're going to give up on that in three days because none of that is enjoyable for you. And so if you can make your morning routine, like even just putting your slippers, like your nice slippers beside you're in Winnipeg, man, in the winter, having like nice slippers beside your bed and knowing you're going to step into those. You don't, you look forward to those things. They're little things, but they make a big difference. Totally. Yeah. Discipline is a lot easier if it's frictionless or it's things at least that you can tolerate and enjoy versus trying to adopt Dave Goggins routine just because it's, it's supposed to be that way. Right? Like who's going to run 16 miles, like uphill, like both there and back. And like, Go I mean, Goggins is great. I like his, I liked his book. Yeah. Um, but that's not my life. I'm not doing that. I got to find things that are going to work for me. Absolutely. Let's talk transformation. I know you uh, went through a, a 16 week ish yeah. transformation, got the photos for it, had a great result. So how did, was this the first of its kind for you, you know, bodybuilding prep, so to speak? Um, I've always been an athlete. So I've always, and I think this is a mistake a lot of people make when they go into a new fitness program, they don't put any kind of end date on it. So if you say, I'm going to just become fit, you know, motivation will wear off. Everybody knows that. That's why the gym is empty in February, right? It's just like motivation wears off. So you, you have to have things you're training for. And so growing up as a runner, we were always goal-oriented. We we're always training for like the championships. You know, in, in, in fitness, this is what we call periodization, right? Like you periodize your training, you train for different things, you let your body come down, and then you kind of climb to the next peak. So training for a specific goal was certainly not new to me. That's something I've done most of my life. But in terms of the before and after photos, yeah, that was new. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you say 16 weeks, the before and after photo I have is a 16 weeks. But what's really interesting, and, and this is, you know, peeling some of the layers back on those before and after pictures you see online, I had been bulking um, and what bulking means is, you know, like I would, I had been putting on muscle for the six months prior to when I started the calorie deficit, eating very low calories. And so I think a lot of folks want to be like, what can I do in 16 weeks? Well, it depends on kind of what's underneath, <laughs> like what's under the hood. Right. And I had, uh, like, if you looked at my photo four that's the one that's online. If you look at my picture four months before the final picture, I don't look good at all but I was the strongest I've ever been in my life. Cause I was, I had trained, trained, trained. I was lifting heavy, heavy, heavy. And then I went into this cut. Um, I did it for a few reasons. I would say the number one reason, and I've, and I've talked about this on our podcast, I only see out of one eye and I've been self-conscious about my eye my whole life, you know, element, Kids at a young age are mean, not because oh, yeah. not they're mean. They just say, they, they, let me rephrase. They're, they're uninhibited. They say what they see, right? Like my own sons ask me, daddy, what's wrong with your eye? Like my, and, and they don't mean it meanly, but mm -hmm. as a kid, you hear it. Right. And so I chose this photo shoot for my personal goal because I was sick of feeling self-conscious around cameras. I just was mm -hmm. like, I just needed to be able to look in the camera and be able to say like, this is who I am. This is what I look like. This is what I'll always look like. This is who I am. And so the photo shoot for me had that level of significance attached to it. M my coach, Ryan Fanley said to me right before, because I was talking about like, I don't know, maybe we could do the camera in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes, just look at the, I don't know if I can swear on your show, but he's yeah, like, go for it. He, goes, he goes, just look at the fucking camera and be a badass motherfucker. Like that's what he said to me. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a, religious guy. I have, I, have a, I have a deep faith, but that line was like so empowering to me. And so that was part of it. Um, and then the other part was, this is the third phase of our transformation program in our group. The third phase is a strict cut to achieve like some mental mastery. And um, that's what the guys were doing. Like all the guys in our group kind of did it with me and I wanted to lead by example. And so I, you know, I, I, I did that. Um, the final piece that I would say around the photo shoot, I love that in 20 years when my sons are in their late 20s, mid 20s, they'll come across these pictures of daddy at age 40 
yeah. and, and daddy was ripped, right? Like I, yeah. I, I totally yeah, you gotta live forever, man. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. I want, I want them to know that they could do it too. Um, it's cool to me, Mitch, when my sons like this year in father's day in my father's day card the, I observed the pictures they drew of me had bigger muscles. Nice. <laughs> totally. Right. Like weird, I to yeah. they totally, you know, but then they're asking me like, you know, daddy, can we do push-ups with you? Daddy, can you show us the gym? Like, you know, they're asking me questions. Mm -hmm. And and someone on the other side of that might be like a little bit vain. You know, that's a little superficial. But I'd rather them see me like go to the gym at 530 every day than collapsing on the couch and, and drinking six beers every night. Right. So, like, I mean, I, I'm I'm very aware of what they're seeing. And so, you know, all those pieces made it significant to me i i, I and, and then and the final piece i enjoyed it like i enjoyed the training for it. i enjoyed there's a lot of when you get that low in calories like the last two weeks i was at 1100 calories this th this is not any kind of model for anyone to follow unless you're doing this particular kind of thing mm -hmm. but it was cool to kind of like manipulate the science and my body and again right after i'm i'm you know back to normal good good sustainable habits but it was cool to like see like how do you actually do these things? It was it was fun to learn. Absolutely, that's huge. Yeah, that was a long that was a long answer, Mitch. No, no, and there's a lot <laughs> of good takeaways from that, and I'll get I'll ask you a certain question. I mean, certainly for me, exercising some demons as being the chubby kid, Mitch Tits was actually my nickname in junior high because I had. Oh, no, that's what they called you. Yeah, so you know, that's seventh hard. graders, they suck, man. It could be harsh, absolutely. <laughs> so there's still some issues in my head, I think, but I think that's also what's driven me to become a fitness coach and try to help people avoid that fate kind of thing. But uh, back to you, mental mastery you mentioned. So obviously the physical transformation, the photos, but what were some of those benefits that went beyond obviously the scale photos and so on from that transformation? Yeah, my, my friend Kyle likes to say, if I can control what goes into my mouth, I can control what comes out of my mouth. Mm. And I think for a lot of people who are committing to like a process of change, Food is a lead domino. Like it's just so easy to lose self-control around food. And there's all sorts of like rationale. For example, like I had to do some weird things during my cut. Like it was my it was my dad's 70th. It was my mother-in-law's 70th. We went to like these big restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I had to basically drink coffee and say to the waitress, hey, how do they make this chicken? Oh, they fry it. Okay. Do you mind if they bake that for me? You had to like kind of do some weird things. And and so usually people don't want to make a scene like that. They don't want to be, well, Goggins calls it the uncommon man. That's what you know, he calls it. Like they don't want to be that person because it looks like awkward or or weird. And so for me, food became the real place where I was trying to win the battles. When you're eating as low calories as I was eating, you really have to be on your game and and the reason i say that is that that self-control that i had to exercise around my nutrition um is the same self-control you need when your kids are freaking out right? right like everyone knows i was i was picking my son up at school the other day and this mother was like stomping away from her child mumbling well, we already canceled his birthday. Now we're canceling Christmas. You know, it's just this, like, you know, it's these like parental moments when our kids trigger us. So yeah. much. they just trigger us, right? Like they do something that is totally age appropriate, but it's so infuriating because it's in public and you just lose your shit. Like you just lose it on your kids. Everyone has had these moments. Like I yelled at my, I yelled at my son the other day to stop yelling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. say it's like what what are we doing here right but you just you've been triggered right and so the the mental mastery that i was referring to is like i i knew my anger in my family is a liability like in my family it's it's just certainly a liability for my kids and for my wife and so going that low in calories made me so cognizant of every feeling and thought that i had and, and before i went really really low on the calories my wife and I had a conversation and I was like, this will happen. I am going to be hangry. And we talked about it a lot. Again, my wife is a child and youth counselor who works with 
teenagers with eating disorders. So this was a bit triggering for her too, because of how low, the, but we had a conversation and she understood the goal that would have an end date, you know, it had a specific end date. Um, but that's, that's really a huge piece of it, right? Once you can, that's why I love fitness. Once you can achieve some self-control in the gym or around your nutrition, particularly, you're just a self-controlled person, right? Like if you can resist the Oreos, then you can resist when a client is like out of line and they're going at you and you, all you want to do is like rip them and tell them what's up, but you hold back because, you know, you know, that's not going to do any good. And so the mental mastery is about becoming a disciplined person. If you want to become a disciplined person, you just do things that require discipline. I think for a lot of people, it's nutrition. That's, that's, you know, it's almost like a, a testing ground three to five times a day. You can like test yourself or prove to yourself. That's a better word. You can prove to yourself. I am a disciplined person. And if I can do it with my nutrition, then I can do it with my kids. I can do it in my marriage. I can do it in my work. Beautiful. Yeah, there's so much overlap between fitness, business, relationships, family, all this stuff. So let's kind of segue to that then, personal development. I know you've had some great guests on your podcast. Something jumped out about the concept of uh, inner room friends, I believe is what you call it. So I'd love to dive into that idea and how you kind of, you know, who you surround yourself with and how that is so important to your success. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a big transition, Mitch. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I think uh, the, the concept comes from one of my favorite authors. His name is Henry Nowen. And, and he talks about, imagine that you are the Lord of a castle or, and, and, and this castle is surrounded by some walls, but then also by a draw or a, a moat with the drawbridge. And I think a good castle functions when we are careful about who we let inside, right? So if I'm the Lord of the castle, you know, picture me in that inner room, who gets to come into that room with me? Who has to say, stay like just outside? They can be in the castle, but they're not in the inner room. And then who doesn't even get to come in? Like, who do we raise the drawbridge right up to? And the reason this concept has worked for me is that I, I think in your life, man, you don't have that many inner room friends, right? They are the people that you can tell anything to, and they would never weaponize it against you, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for some people, that's not even their marriage. Unfortunately, in a lot of marriages, <sighs> their partner is probably not an inner room friend. They're not safe because they know things about you, like maybe you're, you're prone to working too much or you know, you're, you're prone to some other like vice or something and they, they use it against you. Like, like my wife knows I'm prone to excess, like, like in my training, in my, but she doesn't use it against me. So she's in the inner room. I have like a few close friends. I'm 40, man. I, I would probably say I have like five friends. We might also call them funeral friends. And what I mean by funeral friends is these are the people who'd speak at your funeral or even more than that, if something happened to me, they would look after Amy and my boys, right? Like those people come inside. Everyone else you have to use discretion about, about who you let inside. And the reason this has become significant in my life is when you live with vulnerability and you let people know what's up in your life and you, you live with an open heart, that's how I live. You can get really resentful when you're sharing, when you're the one like opening your life up. Like let's use fitness as an example. And you say, let's say you've struggled with your weight your whole life. And you say, um, I want to lose 50 pounds. Which ones of your friends are going to scoff at that, right? Or be like, okay, she's tried this before. He's tried that before, right? Those people outside the castle, drawbridges up. And, and what that means, um, I don't like, I'm not mean to those people. I'm not like, I just don't say anything to those people. I just do not tell them that I have a weight loss goal because they are, I know they will not be safe because what a lot of people do, I think, Mitch, is they, they say to outer room friends, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds. Hoping for what? Like, what are they hoping? They're hoping that the, those people are going to be like, oh, you can do it. You're amazing. You can do And then when that doesn't happen, they get so hurt. They get resentful. And so as I've gotten older, I've realized rather than like hoping 
the outer room people will give me compliments. I just keep them in the outer room. And instead, I tell my inner room people, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I'm trying to lose 50 pounds. Um, you got my back on this? And that's only a small group of people. Um, but, you know, again, at age 40, I'm realizing like, it's okay to say like, you're my best friend. Like it's this like, you know, elementary school thing, but I can say to my like good buddies, like, you know, again, there's four or five of them. Um, Hey man, like this is what's on my mind for real. Um, you got me and they do. Right. And, and everybody else, again, I'm not mean to them. They just don't get to come inside. That's it. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you probably heard the buck, crabs in the bucket story from Bedros. You're surrounded by crabs pulling you down. It's hard to elevate, you know, so you got to with the eagles. So and, surround and it's, the eagles. it's hard too, because sometimes the crabs, Bedros talks about, yeah, that illustration of the one crab is trying to get out of the bucket and the others are pulling them down. Sometimes the crabs are the people, I'm not going to say who know you best, but who have known you the longest. You know what I mean? They, they're those people who have known, it, it's sometimes family, right? And unfortunately, people who have known you for a long time won't let you become a new version of yourself, right? So like, let's say you, again, use, use weight as an example. Let's say for years and years and maybe decades, you always like ate, you ate whatever was put in front of you. You, you didn't. And then all of a sudden you say, Hey, I need to do something about this. I, I need to become, feel more empowered in my body. I need to, I need to just lose some of these pounds. Those people who have seen the other version of you, they're not quick to let you out of that version. And it sucks, right? Like it sucks because they're probably doing it because they feel like threatened, right? They feel like, well, what are you saying? Are you just like, what are you saying? Like you're better than us or that's, you know, it's like high school or something, but like it's, it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes our, people who we wish were in the inner room actually aren't safe. And so we have to have some discretion. And that's why I like the idea of the castle inner room. It's not like excommunicating these close family members. No. It's, you know, they're not in the inner room. You don't confide in them on certain things, but they can still have a good relationship with them. And I, I love that perspective. Yeah, but you talk to those people, outer room people I talk to about non inner room issues. Right. So I would talk to them about like weather, um, Hey, what are we doing today? Like what, movies. Um, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't tell them like stuff about that. I'm really, really worried about with my sons, for example, like something that was really like I was concerned about. I just wouldn't tell them that because I'm not sure what they'll do with it. And rather than getting angry and frustrated, it sounds cold, right? That I like might not tell, like I have a wonderful mother-in-law, but I'll use this as my example. I might not tell my mother-in-law something, you know, it, it sounds unfortunate. I, I would, I would rather though not, let my resentment affect her and my relationship. And so we keep in the other room that, and, and I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I think it's okay. Maybe if she's yeah. listening, she might change it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me rephrase my, my mother-in-law is an inner room person, but I was just using it as an example. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. We're recovered. Okay. Awesome. I mean, that's the personal development stuff I wanted to get into. So kind of just wrap up. I just feel like you really nailed your relationship from the outsider's perspective. Anyway, it seems like you've got a good dialogue and, dynamic in the home. So is I know you, you talked about the daily 15. That's great. Is there any actionable tips for someone who's in a relationship? I know I'm chopping up here in the video who, uh, who is struggling a bit in, at home, trying to balance and everything that helped their relationship move forward. Oh, marriage is so hard, man. It's like, so in our program, we stagger, we stagger our, progress because I think a lot of people want it. So the first thing we do for guys, Mitch is right where we started in this conversation. The first thing we talk about is nailing your morning, nailing your morning gives you such a sense of momentum. Then the next thing is let's, and, and they're in this order. The next thing is let's talk about a gym routine. And because that's waking up uh, is, or a morning routine is, it's not easy, but it's the easiest. Then we talk about fitness. Then we talk about nutrition. Like we've hit all of them today. The, they are getting harder. Each one of these is getting harder. The hardest is a relationship with your spouse because you can't just like, you know, you use the word any tips. There's no like quick tips to have a better relationship, right? Like, because it depends on two people. 
the guys in our group are like, let's wake up at 5 a.m. Let's get to the gym. Absolutely. And we'll get you the accountability to do that. But then when it's like, let's have a better marriage. It's like, wait a minute. You can't just like man up to a better marriage or something. And so what I would say, I don't have any quick tips on a good, solid marriage. But if I could offer one, I would, I would introduce the idea of the emotional bank account. This comes from uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. Highly recommend that book. And I think if you can think of your marriage as an emotional bank account, where what you're trying to do is fill the, the bank of the other person with all sorts of things, with emptying the dishwasher, with you know, taking the kids uh, to, to soccer practice with, with smiles, with hugs, um, with, with sex, with all these things. So as you're um, filling the emotional bank account, what you're actually doing day after day after day is building trust. It's the exact same thing as the gym. I keep using this illustration. Dude, when you go to the gym tomorrow, you're not going to see results you're not going to see results like after the workout. However, if you go to the gym tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, oh, that's, that's actually Macbeth. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> There's a line in Shay tomorrow. If you go tomorrow, then one day you're going to look in the mirror and you'll be like, damn, there it is. Boom. But you don't see it. And I think a relationship is the same. If you can commit to these like little things day after day, let's be honest. There are many daily 15s where me and my wife, like, we don't like leave there feeling like, oh, like enlightened in our relationship, but we keep doing it and doing it so that when the family has to make a withdrawal from the emotional bank account, there's some, there's a balance in there, right? Like if we're, if let's even use 51%, if I give 51% to my marriage, then on the lean times, the times when we're both exhausted, the time when I'm on a strict calorie deficit, this last year, my wife did her master's. That was a hard time that we had to pull from the deposits that we had made over the last you know, 15 years of marriage. But there was stuff in the bank account. And so when we needed to, there was stuff in there that we could pull from it and we weren't pulling from an empty bank account, so to speak. I don't know if that concept that concept works for you, Mitch. It does absolutely. I'm going to dig deeper into that book you mentioned, uh, Stephen Covey. Was it? Stephen Covey is. Covey. Yeah, Covey. He, yeah. You know, seven Covey. habits of highly effective people. Yeah. So he's done highly effective families. Um, the it. other thing that I would recommend, I'm a big reader. Um, I I would if if you want like an immediately actionable step, read the Love Prescription by John Gottman. The Love Prescription. It's seven days to a better marriage. And wow. they introduced the idea of bids for connection. That concept has really helped a lot in our marriage. And so uh, John Gottman, The Love Prescription, highly actionable. You buy it on Audible. You could probably listen to it in about three and a half hours. It's so, so good. Um, so again, I know people like to immediately implement something. Love Prescription would be that. And then the emotional bank account as a bigger picture of your family's wellness might be another thing to think about. Beautiful. Well, we've covered all the bases today, Jen. I appreciate your time. Where can people <laughs> find you on the internet? Men of Bud Rock, of course, is your yeah. yeah, that's our Instagram handle. That's the only place I am. Mitch, I'm telling you, as I've started online, oh, this is a funny moment. My students, so I'm a high school teacher, have obviously found because they understand how to work the interweb. <laughs> and so my Instagram page is men of bedrock. Um, you know, they've seen me now without my shirt on. Right. right. So it's kind of like, but you know, they, I haven't had many kids say, or even my colleagues, maybe behind my back, they're doing it. <laughs> but I think for the most part, the message we're trying to put out is about empowerment. And so it's not about like shaming or like, why aren't you doing this? And so, yeah, like, I hope, I hope that what I'm putting into the universe empowers people um, and makes them feel about, um, you know, just, feel like they can be the best version of themselves so that they can give that version of themselves to their family. So um, that's what I do at on Instagram at men of bedrock. And then uh, we have a podcast as well. The great. Vince Delmonte podcast. I'm on there every Monday with great guests. Mitch, we'll have to have you on. That'd be fantastic. 
I would appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Awesome, Adrian. Well, appreciate your time. We'll shut it down there. We'll see you on the interwebs. Cheers.